Can I start? Thanks. Um, my presentation is going to be in English. Feel free to ask questions in French. I will do my very, very best to answer you. Um, and I know I'm the only thing standing between you and an open bar. So I will go as quickly as possible. And if no one has any questions, we can end early. Uh, it's totally OK. Um, so yeah, I'm Sasha. Uh, I'm a researcher in AI. I have a, I have a PhD, uh, and I've been working for 10 years on, on AI, and specifically how AI impacts society. So I mean, the tech is interesting, but how does the tech connect with society? And there are two particular um, topics I'm really interested in, uh, apart from my research, and that's climate change. So I work for a climate change organization that tries to essentially develop tools to stop climate change with AI. And I also am on the board of Women in Machine Learning. So women are, are less than 11% of AI researchers. So essentially, WIML is an organization that tries to highlight um, essentially the research and practice uh, of women in our field. So to start with, I picked some nice headlines about ChatGPT, BARD, um, passed the doctor's exam. Um, it cost Google something like $100 million because it made a mistake in the, in the demo a couple of uh, months ago, I think. Um, and so you know, we hear about this all the time. But I really want to show you that these, these are real tools. I want to take you back in time a little bit and show you where they came from and um, show you ways to use them in a way that's um, ethically minded. Let's say that. So, this is the winding road of AI. Um, it goes back farther than you would think. So actually, 1956 is the official foundation of the term artificial intelligence uh, by a bunch of guys in, in the United States. They came together and they said, we're going to solve artificial intelligence. We're going to make machines that think. In 1974, they realized that it was harder than they thought. Um, and this is the first AI winter. So essentially, um, for almost 20 years, they had got a lot of money, they got a lot of you know, uh, attention, a lot of press. And then in, 70, in 74, they realized that it didn't really get anywhere, um, especially the US military put a lot of money into it, didn't go anywhere. So for, for um, six years, there was almost nothing that happened. In 1980, we had a new era. Um, it's called expert systems. So essentially, it's rules. If blah, 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 then blah, blah, blah. Long, long lists of rules. Um, and this worked for a little while. But then we had a second day, I went to, in 1987, uh, when we realized that you can't write rules for everything, right? You can't write rules for life in general. And so we had a, a second little period where people were like, AI is never going to get solved. Since 93, things picked up again. We have the rebirth of AI, Deep Blue, IBM Watson, right? Those were like big, big things in the 90s and early 2000s. And then since 2011, we have the era of deep learning. So um, I did my postdoc with Joshua Bengio. He's one of the founders of the field. Um, and so for the last, what, 12 years, it's worked. Um, and it worked well, right? Um, but since the last couple of years, we have something called generative AI. And this is what I'm really going to focus on, because it's a little bit different than all the things that came before. And I want to explain to you why. So before, AI models, you gave it data, right? You gave it, for example, these are, uh, this is like the first AI data set that was really popular for a really long time in the 90s. Um, so you had images of handwritten digits, so handwritten numbers, and what numbers. So this, this is an image of a zero, this is an image of a five, and for like something like 10 years, everyone tried to solve this, like get a system that could read digits that were written by hand and uh, translate it into digits that were typed out. And actually, um, these were the first commercial applications of AI used for, for the post, for recognizing addresses. And so this, this worked. Then we had something called ImageNet, which was the biggest uh, AI data set with 14 million images and labels. So this is a tiger, this is a car, and AI systems are trained to predict the label, predict the category, right? So it, they are trained on a lot of images, they're given new images, and they have to predict the right label. And so this is what happened, this is called supervised learning, if you wanna, if you wanna be impressive. What do AI models now look like? So we've got something like BERT, which is a model that produces text. It was kind of the first large language model. So you input a string. My name is Sasha, and I am a. And it's going to predict the next word. So in this case, it predicts that I'm a vampire based on I don't know what. But essentially, this is based on the text that it's seen. So maybe there's, uh, I don't know, a lot of uh, sci-fi stories or something with vampires named Sasha. I don't know. I can't, I can't know. I can't ask the model, why do you think that Sasha's are vampires, right? And depending on the way, you know, if I can say, uh, hi, my name is Miss Sasha or Mrs. Sasha, that could actually change the, the prediction. But you can never know exactly um, why, how it made the decision. And we also have GPT-4. 
you can give it a, an image of what you have in your fridge, and it's going to actually uh, propose recipes to you. Based on an image, it will generate text, right? So now we have a completely different, different way of seeing the world, different, different AI. Um, this is called generative modeling. Why generative? Because it's creating, right? It's generating new things. Before you had just, you know, you had 10 categories, zero to 10, and that was zero to nine, and that was all the only the only things that the model could predict. Now the model can predict essentially almost anything, and so that's where that's where things get interesting. So, for example, you can use um, some version of, of a generative model to generate radiology reports. So a doctor can run a, a, a scan, and then the AI will automatically write a report. Right? That's, that's impressive, but, but what happens when things go wrong? Can, because I can't ask the model, why did you say what you said? Why do you think this patient has cancer? It can't reply to me. And that can be really problematic because when, especially when things are critical, when people's lives or health is, is, are, are on, the, on the line, you need to be able to ask questions. So I want to tell you about how these models are trained. In order for you to understand that they're not magic, they're technology. And sometimes the line can be blurred, but it's really important to understand how they work. So, you know, things that you can see in, in generative AI models are things like answering your questions, doing your homework, generating cool images of cats or whoever you want. Um, but there's actually a lot going on underneath the water that we don't really see. So um, things like copyright infringement, things like uh, using a lot of energy to be training these models, exploiting underpaid, underpaid workers in order to train them. And so it's important to see like the whole iceberg, not just what's on top of the water, but also everything that's under the water. And so let's uh, go back to our generative AI models. What's the recipe? Say I wanted to cook me a, a generative AI model, what do I do? Well, I start with data. Data is really Number one, you can't go anywhere with it without data, so I need as much data as possible, probably from the internet. So typically you scrape almost all of the internet. There's actually, uh, they're called dumps. So essentially it's all, all, all the websites in all the world that are put into a website where you can download them, so terabytes of data. Sometimes you can do filtering, but filtering costs money and it's actually time consuming because you need to figure out whether each page you want to keep or not. So a lot of people actually don't even filter. Then you do what's called pre-training. So in this case, you train a model in order to predict the next word, like Bert did, right? Sasha's a vampire. So essentially what you do is you put a part of a sentence and you say, what's the next word? And if the model gets it right, you say, okay, good job, model, plus one. And if it gets it wrong, you say minus one. Essentially the model gets trained, but billions and billions and billions of times, like this. So the cat in the... And so when you're finished this step, you have a model that can predict text, right? But it's not ChatGPT. It's not something that you can actually interact with. It's just going to fill in the blanks. And so what's the, the crucial last step in these generative AI models? They're set up to interact with humans. So once a model has been pre-trained, it's set up um, like a chatbot, except in this case, um, humans have to ask it questions and then uh, correct its answers. Essentially, you ask it, give me a chocolate chip cookie recipe, and it will say something completely random, and then you'll fix it all up, and then you'll put it back into the model, and the model will train on it again, and then you keep doing this for thousands and thousands of thousands of hours. Like, really, it's, it's, it's quite, it, it's months of work. Um, this is called reinforcement learning from human feedback, and this is kind of the crucial new um, <laughs> whipped cream ingredient in uh, generative uh, AI models. So before, it was like, whoever has the most data is winning, so Google was winning and Facebook was winning because they had all of our data, but now it's really who can set up the models to be exposed to the most people to talk to them. And this is how um, these models have gotten so good almost overnight, right? All, all of a sudden, ChatGPT came and we were like, whoa. Um, so, but to look at the data, it's actually pretty interesting because the common crawl, this is really everything from the internet. And you can imagine there's a lot of stuff on the internet that you don't want your model to be trained on, right? But every couple of months, the common crawl provides a, a dump of data. And so you can, have, you can extract the text. Say I want to do a language model, I can just take the text. I can take images because it has URLs. So you actually I can say, okay, I want to get every URL that has JPEG or PNG or whatever. I want to download them all. I can do that as well from the common crawl. I can do pairs of images. So what's used for, um, for example, Dolly or Stable Diffusion, they're pairs of images and the descriptive text. So for people, for example, who um, are vision impaired, they have screen readers. And in order to help the screen readers interpret images, you have alt text. It's called alternative text. And so you have pairs of images and text, and those are used to train these AI models. And so essentially, I can do whatever I want with this data and use whatever part is interesting to me. But 
there's a bunch of questions, right? And it's, what's really interesting is true that, like ChatGPT said, um, we're still figuring out the, the wild, wild west of AI. But for example, what if I put, out, put up a website with you know, a book or, or some text of mine, and I don't want the AI model to be trained on this data? What if I have copyright Sasha Lucioni at the bottom of the page, and then that gets, that gets ignored when the model is training? Who, who, can, I, who can I complain to, right? Um, also, how do I figure out if there's unacceptable content, if there's you know, hate speech, if there's pornography, if there's you know, stuff that I essentially don't want the model to uh, reproduce? How do I figure that out? These, these training corpora are so big that even to download them, you need a specialized computer. Also, how about consent, right? What if I find an image of me in this data set and I want to say, Take it out. I don't want my image to be in this training data set. Who, who can I ask, right? How, how can I complain? And actually, for artists and designers whose work, whose life's work, has been hoovered up by these, uh, by these algorithms, and then, you know, if you're an artist, you can actually say, uh, you know, a cat in the style of this artist, and it will make that cat, right? There's the question of, well, maybe the artist didn't want that to happen, right? So how do we, how do we uh, enforce consent? And so most web scrapes data, scrapes data sets just ignore this. They say, well, you know, this is a, this is a new field. We, we, don't really know, we don't really know what the problems are. And so we're starting to see lawsuits. We're starting to see really people, artists, for example, are suing the creators of some of these models saying, I don't want my art, I don't want my life's work to be uh, used in this model. So that's, but we still don't have the mechanisms to enforce this. We can't, it's really hard to even prove that uh, my data was used in the model unless the the creators of the model will tell me. They'll tell me, oh yeah, you know, this is a list of all the images we use to train our model, but they don't do that. <laughs> they tend not to do that. So this is a really hard, hard question. Um, and also, um, these models are really, really getting big. So this is a plot from the last, what, four years? Uh, these are billions of parameters. So we went from 100 million to essentially hundreds of billions of parameters. These models are getting bigger and bigger and bigger which requires more data. So we have this kind of like endless loop of <laughs> more data, more model, more model, more data, right? Um, more training. So this means uh, very powerful hardware. This means thousands of GPUs. Um, so for example, a model that uh, was trained Bloom in 2022 used 1 million GPU hours, a million hours of training. Um, and also it needs a lot of effort from humans, you know, tuning, experimentation. So essentially it's, it's getting kind of out of hand. More parameters, more problems. Uh, something that I particularly work on is understanding the environmental impact of these models. Because imagine that you have a million hours of GPUs uh, that use electricity that was generated using coal, right? Coal is being burned, is producing CO2. And so, and you also have, for example, the, uh, the GPUs themselves, you know, when you make information um, technology tools, if you make computers, if you make smartphones, they take raw metal, they take water, they take energy as well. And so this is all really adding up, especially that now, you know, before I could train, when I started in AI, I could train a, a model on my laptop. I had one GPU that was kind of bad, kind of slow, but I can tr still train a model. Now you need a supercomputer with a million GPU hours in order to train one of these models. And so, of, of course, this really adds up in terms of environmental impacts. And so, for example, a couple of the recent models, they emit up to 500 tons of CO2. So to give you an idea, one ton is, a bit, is about one flight from, say, Quebec City to uh, London. So one there and back over the ocean is roughly one ton of CO2. This is a 500 flights um, just to train a language model. Uh, I guess the question is, you know, wh where do we draw the line? Um, and also the human interaction angle, right? Um, this isn't magic. This is human beings interacting with the model and, and giving it their intelligence, right? Because the model is not magically intelligent. It has to be trained. And so um, these thousands of hours uh, are actually human labor, right? That never gets recognized. So there was a recent um, expose by Time Magazine that says that most of the workers that were training uh, chat GPT were based out of poor countries usually. So these, these uh, workers were in Kenya, they were getting less than $2 an hour and they were working 14 to 16 hours a day. And often uh, they were exposed because part of their work was also to detect when ChatGPT was saying stuff that it shouldn't say, right? So they were also exposed to a lot of toxic content, a lot of hate speech for $2 an hour. And of course, they're not recognized anywhere. So this is another aspect because, you know, um, when, for example, ChatGPT gets made into products, these people never get recognized. They never get 
they're never seen. They're invisible, essentially. But it was their livelihoods that, that gave ChatGPT all this magic intelligence. And actually, above and beyond um, kind of general intelligence, now more and more, um, these companies are hired, hiring very skilled and talented people, like program, uh, programmers, like um, poets, like authors, because you, if you need your model to write code, you need someone to teach it to write code. If you want it to write a haiku, you need someone to teach it what a haiku is, right? And so now more and more we're seeing it's not just crowdsourcing. It's really like hiring programmers to teach the model a better JavaScript. And, and, and this is, you know, it, it's very hard to get a, a, a grasp of how much, um, how much labor is being put into it because essentially it's not, it's not declared anywhere. So what can be done? I don't want to be uh, too uh, apocalyptic because there are things what, that are already being done. So I don't know if you've seen the recent news about um, the open letter to stop AI research or uh, the US Senate discussion last week. Um, so they kind of say, well, it's already too late, right? There's superhuman, dangerous AI that's going to maybe take over the world. It's going to be smarter than human beings, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, we're very far from there. And also, there are a lot of people doing research that's um, actively trying to make sure we don't get there. Because it's not like uh, you know the train is on the tracks and it's going to roll towards the cliff. It's really kind of like we're creating the tracks as the train is rolling. And so depending on which direction we want the tracks to go, we still have uh, control over this. And so, uh, for example, uh, when I finished my PhD, I had a lot of offers from, from Google and Facebook and whatnot. And I chose Hugging Face, which is um, actually a startup. And um, their mission is to democratize uh, good machine learning. So machine learning is, is, is essentially artificial intelligence. And so all of the work we do is to help people do better AI, essentially. So it's not necessarily us who are training these models, but we're making tools for people to train um, more ethical, more responsible models. We're helping um, developers use the models in a way that's you know, kind of uh, respectful of humans and society and things like that. And so that's, I'll talk about some of the work we're doing and some of the work that the broader community is doing um, in order to make sure that the, the train tracks go in the right direction. So for example, to start with data. Um, I, I talked about consent. It's actually really important. Maybe sometimes we talk about consent in a very <laughs> specific uh, use case, but consent is really important in, in society in general, right? You don't want people doing things to you that you didn't consent to. And so data and consent is really becoming a big Aspect. So, uh, for example, there, we, we've created some tools for um, exploring big data sets. So, for example, this is a data set um, that was used to train text to image models. So, these are images with captions, right? So, we were looking in these images and we found a lot of medical data. So, we found images of people before and after surgeries. We found um, also radiology and stuff, things like that. So, there was actually so much. Uh, sensitive, you know, identifiable. There are names of people, names of clinics, names of conditions. And so, you know, someone could find an image of you and find out that you have a condition, I don't know, like AIDS that you didn't want people to know about, right? And so, for example, uh, we're working with um, a company called Spawning in order to create um, essentially ways for people to indicate that they don't want their data to be in this, in this um, data set. And so what we're doing now is we're um, trying to essentially uh, reach out to people who, whose uh, emails, whose names we find, especially artists as well, actually. This is a, a big focus on artists. And to send them these um, opt-out requests saying, OK, if you want to, if, if you don't feel comfortable with your, for example, your art being used in this data set or your clinical data being used in the data set, please, please tell us. And we're really gathering, you know, right, we have 42 million images that we've removed so far by, you know, people saying, I'm not okay with this. And of course, um, we can't force people to stop using the data sets that they're using because we have no legal ways so yet. But we can say, this is the ethical version of this data set. You know, this is like the official you know, stamp of approval, use this data set. And this one, we found some, um, some concerns. And so that's, we've been, that's what we've been doing. We've been um, adding these kind of um, disclaimers and, and trying to nudge people in the right direction of using more consensual data. Um, another thing we're doing is actually, so imagine that some of these data sets are billions and billions of data points. And so how do you understand a data set when it's so big? People say now it's, it's, too, big, it's too big to document. That's what people call it nowadays. Because essentially it's like 
you know, you take the whole of the internet and you stuff it into your AI model, and then you don't have to worry about anything because it's just too big. Um, but we're creating tools for people to understand their data better. So uh, for example, uh, we have a tool called Data Measurements that allows you to plug in a data set, and it's going to essentially if it's big, it's going to take a little bit of time, but it's going to go through the whole data set and find you, find you duplicates, find you low-quality content, find you all sorts of things that, you know, after that, you can decide to remove them or not, but it's just going to tell you, you know, there's a bunch of duplicates. Do you really want, like, 50 times the same thing? And then you can say no and, and remove it, and essentially understanding your data better. We also have um, tools that help you understand the, the metadata, so essentially the data about the data. So for example, what are the sources? Um, for this data set, it's actually a medical data set, so what are, what's the population who gave up their data? So for example, like how many adults are there? How many children are there? You know, where are they coming from? Things like that. Um, that's important because especially if you're using medical data, you should be doing it in a way that, for example, maybe you shouldn't be using kids' data, right? Um, and so, essentially, if you analyze the metadata, you also get an idea of what the underlying, uh, for example, the radiography reports are, right? If you just look at the images, you don't know if this is a child or this is an adult, but if you look at the metadata, you, you, um, you can find that out. Um, also, model access. So this is um, a plot that a colleague of mine made uh, on the x-axis, on the, on the horizontal axis. It's dates, so essentially going forward in time, the last two years. Um, the y-axis is size, so the higher up it is, the bigger the models are. And the colors mean access. And so essentially, uh, red means only, only the creators of the model have access to the model. Uh, green means anyone has access to the model. And blue and yellow are kind of in the middle, so it depends, essentially. And what we're seeing as time goes on and as the models get bigger is that the biggest, most powerful models are only belong to companies, right? They only belong to companies that... Um, use them to make money, essentially. Um, and that's problematic because essentially if a model is closed and you essentially can't study it like uh, what we do normally with models, that means we can't understand how it fails, right? So a model like BARD, there's no way uh, for me, for example, if I wanted to, to ask to get access. I can't. It's a proprietary product. And that means that I can't say whether it's sexist or whether it is toxic or things like that. And so essentially, as, a, as an accessibility issue, that's really problematic for us as a field. And so we're having these really big models. As I showed you, there's no way of understanding them. We can't ask the model why it did what it did. And even if we could try, usually it invents things that's, that are false, because I know that now you can actually ask ChatGPT or Bing or whatever. You can be like, why did you answer this? And it's going to say, oh, because blah, 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 but actually it just invents that too. So it's not, <laughs> it's not very useful. Um, we don't know what the, what the data is. Actually, um, for both uh, ChatGPT and BARD, there's absolutely, we have no idea. Maybe it's, you know, people have... Um, have um, hypotheses that actually our emails are, for example, from Gmail and things like this are being used to train AI models, but we don't know because no one tells us, right? And for OpenAI, we don't know where their data is coming from. So that's problematic when you want to do research and, and ethical AI. And so um, also uh, there's a very um, big monopoly of these large language models because it takes so much money to train them, like um, something like you know, $15 million for each AI model. Who can afford that? Well, big tech companies, sometimes very big universities like Stanford. But other than that, you know, no one can afford to train these models, which means that there's a monopoly, right? So we're seeing this really kind of strange power dynamic happening in, in AI right now. And the more I, for example, go, uh, recently I was in South America at a conference, everyone's like, we just can't participate. We can't publish at conferences. We can't, you know, we can't train our own models because we don't have the compute necessary, right? So we're, we're seeing this really a digital divide, essentially, between the people who have access and the people who don't have access. And so open source models are really important in that, in that aspect because um, you can, for example, I make a model and you can take my model and make it better. Uh, whatever better means to you, but you can keep training it, you can add a language, you can add right, other ways of functioning, so open source is really important. And so it helps scientific progress in, in the sense of you're not just starting from scratch. Like right now, some people, what pe some people are doing are they're trying to reproduce chat GPT, right? Because we don't know how it works. They're just starting from the beginning and saying, okay, I'm gonna try to figure out how chat GPT works. But you, you can't do that. It, it, it takes a really long time, essentially. But if I share my model, you can keep improving it. And so, for example, um, we're seeing now that uh, ChatGPT and BARD are still the best models, for sure. Uh, but we're starting to see open source models catching up. 
So, um, and the, th the thing is, is that when, for example, Llama came out, which is the Facebook model that they open sourced, people used it to make a new one, which is called Alpaca. And then people took Alpaca and then made another one that's called Vicuna. It was a mammal thing. They kept on <laughs> giving it mammal names. <laughs> anyway, but now, the, it, you know, we're coming closer and closer to proprietary models because of open source. And it's not one single lab doing all this. It's, you know, some, some lab out of, uh, I don't remember where it was. It was a university lab that took Llama and then made it better. And then someone else took uh, their model and made it better. And this is how progress happens. And that way we can keep building up upon it. And we're not um, dependent, right? We're not dependent on ChatGPT. We're not dependent on BART. And so it's really uh, important to cr keep creating these models. Um, a model that I was involved in actually uh, last year, it's called Bloom. And uh, it was a completely international uh, endeavor. We had a thousand, something like 300 researchers from around the world who, who volunteered their time in order to make this model together. And uh, we got uh, compute from, um, from a public source and we had a million, no, we had three million uh, GPU hours that were given to us for free. And we built this Bloom model, which was multilingual. We had like 60 languages. Uh, it was as big as everyone else's. Um, but you know, this was really a first, and it, maybe it wasn't as good as ChatGPT, but we made you know, a point that this was possible. Um, something else that's really important, uh, you know, if you, if you code, documentation is really important, on doing readmes and things like that. Um, until a couple of years ago, AI models didn't have readmes, so you're just supposed to figure it out. <laughs> so, you know, if someone made a model and shared their model, you were supposed to just magically know um, how to use it. So now we're working on model cards. So Hugging Face uh, created a whole tool and like a, a bunch of essentially websites that you can use to make these models um, to help people understand, you know, how they work, how they were trained, how, how they fail. That's really important as well, you know, saying, okay, I, I noticed that my model is bad at this. Don't use it for this. It's not made to do that, right? And that's really important. It's important to be honest about what your model can't do because if you just take a model and, and use it for something it's not meant to do, you can't predict its behavior. It can, it can do things you weren't expecting. And also it allows comparing different models. So for example, you put in your model card like some accuracy numbers, some, some performance numbers, and you can compare, compare different models. And so pick the one that does the best on what you're looking for. Um, something that I particularly believe in is ethical guidelines because um, so until maybe you know five years ago, AI was really something that was very theoretical or I mean maybe eight years ago, and now it's, it's very practical. <laughs> so you create a model and tomorrow that model can be used in something that you weren't expecting, a robot, uh, you know, a smartphone. Or... So you really need to think of what you're doing and the theory, the, 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 the programming, and how it can uh, affect society. And so um, what I was working on is, um, so there's, there's a really, really big AI conference called NeurIPS. Um, here, it's a, it brings together something like 10,000 AI researchers every year, and it's kind of like the Super Bowl of AI, I've heard it called. Um, but uh, it didn't have any ethical guidelines, so people were submitting things like um, an AI model for changing women's clothes, and one of the uh, applications was changing jeans to miniskirts. And that was accepted to NeurIPS a couple of years ago. And then there was like putting makeup on women uh, also accepted to NeurIPS a couple of years ago, and you know there was there was no guidelines. So people just submitted things they thought was were fun or or interesting. I mean, of course, there was a lot of really interesting research too. But you know, there was a lot of research where, yeah, or like you know, data sets that were scraped from um, CCTV cameras, so surveillance cameras. And so people would download the data and like submit it to NeurIPS, saying, "Hey, I have a data set of people who didn't know their data was collected." Essentially, so we created these guidelines saying you can't submit your research to NeurIPS unless you you know um, pay pay the people who, uh, who helped gather your data get uh, consent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have like a whole list of things that people need to um, declare or else they can't publish at this conference. And it might not seem like a big deal, but you know, when, if you are, um, I don't know, a PhD student or even a, a researcher and you need a, you know, a little check mark, uh, it's really important to have a publication at NeurIPS. So um, that was something I worked on recently. Um, and so the final thing I, I wanted to talk about is, um, is model outputs. So maybe from the initial explanation I made, uh, you could understand that before supervised learning, you could always check your answer, right? You can, you can say, this is a six, draw a six, and if the model says it's a three, then that's a wrong answer, right? You know what the right answer is, you know what the wrong answer is. Um, in generative AI, there, there are no right answers, um, and, but machine errors can impact human lives. So there was a couple of, uh, 
scandals, quote unquote, recently. So for example, there was an AI model that was deployed in order to predict cr criminal um, sentencing in the United States. So for example, whether uh, someone is low risk or high risk and how much time they should spend in prison. Um, and of course, it was uh, very racist. Uh, and so it was being used for years and years to essentially you know, assign people how much time they spend in prison uh, based on AI. Um, and so they took it down, et cetera. But these are the kinds of things that we should be getting um, <laughs> ahead of, not behind. And this is a more recent example from ChatGPT, <laughs> right? A function to check if someone would be a good scientist. And uh, you know, if race is white and if gender is male, then they're a good scientist. Uh, and this is, you know, this has probably been fixed, <laughs> but these things keep coming up. And how do we really evaluate this? Um, and so this is, there's no right answer. There's no evaluation data set, there's no image net, there's no uh, digits written and labeled, there's, there's not really anything we can use. And also we can't access the underlying models, right? If I wanted to evaluate ChatGPT, I can, I can send you some screenshots, but otherwise, like even if you go and try to do the same thing, chances are it won't give you the same answer because these are stochastic parrots, they change their output, right? Um, something I, I said in an interview that people now use a lot is uh, ChatGPT could be three raccoons in a trench coat. Um, it was just like it was just like an offhanded thing that I said, and I didn't think they would quote it. But Bloomberg quoted it, and then someone else quoted it, and then now people are like, "Oh yeah, you called GPT Chat GPT a raccoon. You're that person." I was like, "Yeah, that was me. I called Chat GPT a raccoon." But anyways, I mean, you don't know what's under the hood. It could be one model, it could be ten models, it could be you don't know. You don't know what are the components of Chat GPT, and that means it's hard to evaluate it. Um, a project I worked on recently um, was evaluating text to image models, which are particularly tricky because you know you have the text and you have the image, and so it's like, how do you evaluate them separately together? But uh, essentially, what we did was we made some tools in order to compare two models. So you say I want um, a portrait of a CEO, and you can compare different models. And so on your left, you can see Stable Diffusion, which is uh, an open source model, and on your right, you see Dolly 2. And I mean, they're all arguably very undiverse, but it's interesting, no matter what, what adjective, what description you put, Dolly will always output white men as CEOs. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite surprising. Whereas for stable diffusion, if you say, for example, um, I don't know, uh, from, from, from France, you can get a bit of uh, diversity, you can, you can kind of give some adjectives, you can say uh, a CEO of a pharmaceutical company, and then it's gonna give you, you know, not only white men, but Dolly too is always white men. And so what, what really happens, um, when the when these oh yeah, there's actually a couple of other tools we made so for example um, average faces uh, the one on the top it's for a given profession how what is the average like what's if you compare all of the images can you get like a ghost um, representation so for example for janitor Dolly still makes white men uh, but stable diffusion actually makes more men of color, which is something. Um, also, we found a lot of cultural stereotypes. So for example, if you do Native American, it will show you people in head, headgear. If you say Asian, it will often show you waitresses or people doing uh, hair, hair or nails. Like, it's got these very, very clear like, cultural biases that it's really hard to, to find if you're not like, asking a lot of questions to the model. So we created a couple of these tools, we call them Bias Explorer. And so essentially you could do, and you can, you can keep exploring, you can keep like, figuring out what are the different parameters of bias. And actually what's interesting for Native Americans is that no matter what you put, Native American uh, you know, going for a walk, Native American at work, Native American wherever, it will always uh, make people in headdresses. And obviously, Native Americans don't always wear headdresses, right? And so it's interesting to see these things visually because it's hard to explain them, it's hard to analyze them, but when you look at them, you can start to get um, some observations, essentially. Um, and so we, we created this website where you can kind of explore different uh, professions uh, and you can really, that's the thing, you can't say that these are real people because they're not real people, right? But you can start making kind of high level, um, analyses like the CEOs. Uh, all the CEOs are white men in glasses. Maybe that's some, <laughs> something special, right? And so we created a website where people can kind of play around with different models and we're still adding models. Um, because for example, now there's a lot of people making anime models. So like something you can, um, you can input, I don't know, like uh, whatever, Sasha, and it will make 
Sasha as a Disney princess or whatever, but what we've noticed is that they're very, um, they're very uh, biased in terms of like gender. So men can be like, you know, kind of neutral, but women will always be half undressed or, uh, you know, very car caricatural, uh, very anime style. Um, and so we're trying to make also like tools like this, but for even not very realistic images as well, just so people see what they output. And why does this matter? So maybe you can think, okay, well, these are, these are just, you know, they just make pretty pictures, right? But first of all, um, Getty Images, which is a, a um, like a stock image website where you can go and look for images on, on their website, they've already started using generative AI images because, for example, if you're looking for, I don't know, a purple dog in a green suit with a yellow balloon, maybe no one actually took an image like that in the whole of humanity. And so you, they propose for you to generate images using Dolly 2 which is the white men in suits model. Um, and so that can be problematic, right? If you're looking for images of CEOs from your website and no matter what you do, you cannot get it to output anything but white men in glasses. Um, maybe that's problematic for your website because you want more diversity in the CEOs that you show, for example. Um, and also we found some people using Dolly for um, forensic sketching. So for example, uh, it's a tool to help um, find criminals essentially. And you know, like usually it's a, uh, it's it's manual or or actual artists drawing it, but sometimes you know you can you can select the hairstyle, you can select glasses, you can select a mustache, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In this case, you do a description textually, so you say a man, blah blah blah, and it will generate an image. And uh, you can also just do a description, kind of a general description. And we found that if you put gang member, it's always going to be black people. If you put uh, criminal, it's only going to be Latino and black people. So essentially, for example, you know if you start using these tools in, in criminal settings, kind of like the prediction of prison sentences, you're gonna start, you know, because people get influenced, because you can be like, it could be a dark night, and you know, if, if you see an image, you can be like, oh yeah, that kind of looks like that guy, but maybe not at all. And so, you know, if these, if these models get used in kind of really uh, high risk settings, like the medical setting, and like the um, criminal setting, this can have really real effects on real people, right? So this is not just, uh, uh, just research for research sake. Um, uh, as a closing note, and I want to have time for questions if you want, um, I, I, I hope that people um, realize that AI is complex, but also that AI belongs to everyone. So it's not just you know Google and OpenAI, but there's a lot of people doing a lot of things. And um, it's actually important to keep that diversity. It's important not to uh, rely on ChatGPT for everything because ChatGPT is one model with one data set, with one you know, company behind it. But you know, even if you want to diversify the types of AI models you use, that's already something because um, the more we use it, the more power it gets. The more it's, you know, it's kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if you're saying that it's an oracle and it's always right, and you keep using it, and it keeps on being right, and and after that, we only have one representation of the world. But the world is not one thing, right? Especially um, since we know that these models have biases, and so essentially, what if we um, rely on them too much, these biases become a reality, right? And all of our websites will have images of white male CEOs in glasses, and all of the sketches of criminals are going to be black people. But that's not not what we want, right? And so um, I'm hoping that you, you can reflect a little bit on um, our reliance on these tools and how you can be a little bit more critical of them. And also um, kind of think about all the uh, underwater stuff, right, that I showed you on that, on that slide, that there's a lot of things that go in there that you don't see. And so, you know, ChatGPT is cool and writes really cool stuff, but um, it's based on human labor, it's based on uh, natural resources, it's based on a lot that you don't see. Um, and so it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and so I hope you enjoyed my talk. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, please.